Aloha, and welcome back to The Creative Life from the American Creativity Association on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Phyllis Bleas, and our co-host is Darlene Boyd. Today on the show, we will be discussing poetry, knowing why the revolution must come. Our guest is Dr. Roger Reeves. Dr. Reeves is a poet who has said he wants to be catapulted into a poem. We'll ask him about that. He earned his PhD in poetry at the University of Texas at Austin, where he is currently an associate professor of poetry. He earned a prestigious National Education Association Fellowship and a Pushcart Prize. And his work has been selected for anthologies and has been published in the New Yorker, Poetry Magazine, and more. Dr. Reeves' first collection is published under the title King Me, and he has a new collection coming out in February or March of 2022 soon, and it's called Best Barbarian. Before we meet Dr. Reeves, I want you to know you can send your questions in by email to questions at thinktechhawaii.com. Welcome, Roger. Let me start with you. Hello. Thank you for having me. Oh, you're, well, we're very grateful to have you. And my first question, I've already alerted you. What do you mean by wanting to be catapulted into a poem? I, I think what I mean, uh, and there's many ways to be catapulted, but uh, one of the ways I'm interested in being catapulted into a poem is through the language. I want to either hear a snatch of language or uh, be driven to write something down, um, something that won't is, that is unescapable uh, and something that won't let me go, right? Um, I'm, I want that sort of impetus because that feels inevitable, right? Um, I want the thing that I make to feel inevitable. I want language because that to me is where transformation can occur or where probably beauty resides um, or difficulty right difficulty resides in what won't let you go um, and so i'm always interested in sort of that and that catapulting could be again language it could also be image it could be i see something um or there's a mood right sometimes it's a mood you have a feeling and you're looking for the language of that feeling and you're sort of feeling around for or sometimes it's, for me, the catapulting comes through reading. Um, you know, great work will want, in some ways, a book will make you want to be in conversation with it. And I think as a writer, I'm always interested in what someone else has said and then sort of little gaps and absences that I find in, in that thing. Um, like David Ferry is an amazing poet who I often find uh, a lot of space in his work. And an invitation to write. And that to me is that catapulting, right? It, the catapulting could be an invitation, like come into the house, you know. I, you know, there's alchemy almost the way you talk about the words being a kind of serving as sort of an alchemical transubstantiation mm -hmm. of feelings made manifest through your words. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I definitely think that words act alchemically. Uh, I think sound does that, right? Like that is the nature of something. Uh, I think that's why all the, you know, great biblical books, all the great sort of spiritual texts start with sound or some type of utterance that makes a thing. So, um, you know, I think about Ashe or Amen or, you know, Om, all these different sounds that sort of can transform the physical and the spiritual and they move sort of because they sort of start in the body and start somewhere else, but they become physical, they become manifest, and then they, they're ephemeral as well, they disappear. So it's as if the process, right, of language itself mimics this alchemical process. Um, mm -hmm. Like I say hello or come in, and then you come into my house, right? I think this is why, like in vampire tales, like you have to invite in the vampire, right? Um, I think that there's something to that invitation, right? Like you're sort of requesting the fate of of the vampire right uh of that sort of energy and so i think language does that yes and and you're in in your 
you know, Darlene and I are in the American Creativity Association trying to catalyze this force, this creative force in many ways, and this alchemy and your language and poetry. It's, it seems to, to get right at the heart and the juice of the creative self. Uh, and which takes me to the title for today's show. And you say, how, and I'm wondering, how does poetry tie in with this knowing, knowing why the revolution must come? That's, I, that's a provocative title and you helped us craft it. What revolution, what revolution is coming and why does poetry help us know that? This is coming, you know, I, yeah. We haven't talked, the, the audience should know, we haven't really talked about this yet. So I'm going to be learning along with the audience about your title for today. Sure. So the title kind of comes out of this moment. Um, it's, can I tell a little story? I guess I should tell a little story. Uh, you know, they say great lessons are, you know, the great lessons of life are learned through narrative. Uh, or at least Toni Morrison would argue, would have argued that. Um, but I was, I was actually traveling to Alaska for the first time. And I was in uh, Juneau. And I remember it's a very quiet city, very quiet. It was February or so, and I get there. And the first thing I always do anytime I go to a new place is I go to its bookstores. I run it and then I go to its bookstores. Those are the first things because I want to sort of feel out what the place feels like on the everyday. And I go to this bookstore and it's a great used bookstore. And I find an old Audrey, an old copy of an Audrey and Rich book. And Audrey and Rich, the poet, uh, essayist. Uh, and I turned to his poem, Dreamwood. And I'm supposed to give this talk at, um, at, a, at a local library in Juno. And I read this poem, Dreamwood. And, the, you know, it's, re, it's talking about, and then all of a sudden there's this line in the middle of the poem where it's like, poetry isn't revolution, but a way of knowing why it must come. And that connected to me with this other thing that I had been reading from uh, Foucault, these lectures I had been reading of Foucault from years and years and years ago on parhesia, the idea that like, so there's this concept that the Greeks had, and you saw it in Euripides, when a lesser, like say it was the court jester or a servant had to tell the truth to the king or queen or the emperor, to the emperor, or to someone like the, the a Senate, and that servant had to speak truthfully, they knew that if they said something that could upset the empire, emperor or the empress, they could get their heads cut off, right? They could die, they could be killed for this. And so they would ask for parhesia so that they could tell the truth. Oh. And the, the potentate understood that, hey, if this person says, I need parhesia, then, they're going, then we have to grant them that, and I can't kill them for what they're going to say. Mm. And I thought this was such an interesting sort of civil idea. Uh, I, 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 don't, I feel like we need a little parhesia in our world. But I started thinking about parhesia and the idea of, of being able to know why something must come and to be able to speak it and to say it. Um, and so to me, when I hear that poetry isn't revolution, um, I think about poetry won't necessarily get us universal health care. Poetry won't, uh, won't change the fact that we use, use currency, right? Poetry isn't, but it can announce why we might need to have new ways of thinking about economics. It can announce why we might have to allow for more than two genders, right? It can announce why Black people need to be free, right? Poetry can, be, can sort of imagine and begin to see a future. It can begin to articulate that future. And often what happens is the poem is at the space or in the space of the unsayable. It's in the space mm. of the necessity to make a future that doesn't exist, to try to make the invisible visible. That's revolution, right? That is the revolution, right? So a revolution is, it, I think about the term in big and small ways, right? We can think about economic revolutions. We can think about I think when uh, we can think about France, we can think about those types of revolutions, the U.S., right? The Civil War, those are revolutions, right? But there's also revolutions um, in our own lives, right? And sort of in order for some of the bigger political revolutions, like when we want a world for which uh, equity really exists, or we want a world in which 
black people can walk out their door and feel safe and feel uh, that the police, it, it, can we imagine, like, how do we begin to imagine worlds without police, right? Yes. That begins personally. That begins in the, like, imagining a world for which you don't police yourself. There's imagining worlds in which you think of your community, if you're of color, community of color, as not harmful, as not always lacking, right? As your community is big, beautiful. And because uh, I don't, you know, I don't think the police are really here for, for all of us. <laughs> I think they're mostly here for, for us black and brown folks, right? Um, and so to me, this is part of that revolution, right? The poetry begins to sort of uh, make possible in us. You, you know, what did you think about either Darlene and, and Roger? When I listened to Amanda Gorman, the National Youth Poet Laureate at the, at the inauguration, for Biden and Harris, I, of that whole proceedings, I was so moved by her voice and the language. I thought that she brought to bear in the moment both a revolutionary voice, an emotional voice, a uh, transforming voice, but also a conforming voice. I felt connected. I, 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 I felt woken up and connected to what we are all experiencing in the great divides today. And just through the cadence, the, the, the language and uh, her poetry. And I wondered if you had felt the same. Does that kind of get, if you had a chance to watch her. Yeah, I, I didn't, but uh, Dar I didn't have a chance to watch it, but Darlene, I was wondering what you thought, what you may have. Um, I, in listening to Phyllis frame her question, I can't help but think of you, and, and we we hope to have you read a little bit in your voices as we progress later on in the short time that we have. Um, I found, and, and Roger, I have to say, I'm hooked on your poetry right now. I, I think I have tried to absorb almost every poem, and I'm going to share a few things with you and why I say that. And, and thanks to YouTube, I am able to hear you read the poems. You have several up on YouTube. So uh, you and I come from a, a similar geographic background, and I was particularly moved. Well, let me backtrack just a little bit. Let me ask you to set the stage. Why poetry for you? Why not prose? Why poetry? That's a great question. That's a, uh, started in first grade. It really was the first thing I gravitated to, toward uh, when I was interested in art. And I didn't even know it was art at the time. Interesting. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't know it was art. I just thought it was, I was raised in a, in a Pentecostal church where we had to recite poems uh, during Easter and Christmas. And so I was just raised around poetry as a like form of spoken, even though I was learning it off the page. Mm -hmm. um, so it's always just been the way that I've thought about language. I do write prose, um, but I find poetry a bit more seductive. Uh, I find poetry, it's really funny. It's, it, I think it's like a poor people's art. Um, it doesn't require much. Uh, it doesn't require, you know, like when I think about like art, you know, visual art, for instance, mm -hmm. painting or sculpting, mm -hmm. right? That requires material outside of yourself to some degree. And I think I chose poetry or why I chose poetry to start my artistic career. It's not the only place, but why I think I chose poetry as my starting round was I grew up, you know, with a single mother who we didn't have a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. What we did have, my grandmother, we lived with my grandmother, and what she had was she had this <laughs> coffee can full of pens, and we had, like, old paper, and I just would, that's, and so I was like, okay, I want to make things, and all we had were these pens and reams of paper, and so that's and why. And there I, it was, okay. Yeah. Well, I just, not, not, not to take us through a lesson on prose versus poetry, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I think the most simplest, simplistic 
description would be that prose, you're just writing something. And to me, poetry, you're bringing in and drawing in the senses. Of course, there's the rhythm and, and all of the logistics that I can't speak to that you can and that you do demonstrate and illustrate. And I didn't answer your question, and I should. You asked me what I thought of, of our little poetess. Uh, as I was watching the inauguration and watching her, I was thinking back to uh, when we had, I work in a center, an outreach center, mostly focusing on, on Brown and Black students, uh, but we were very fortunate to have Maya Angelou come in. We were funded, there were 300, or 3,000, excuse me, students in the Bren Center, a big center, and the students, of high school students came in, of course, they were rather noisy when they came in, and and there was some chatter even when, when Maya Angelou began. But I would say 12 minutes into that program, there, there wasn't a single sound. They were riveted. And that was the sound of her voice. She was also demonstrating and ex explicating her poetry, as you just have with defining for Phyllis your perception of the revolution as it relates to poetry. And, and, and in, in many ways, Maya Angelou was doing the same. But it, it was just amazing. And I think if someone, if they had been given a book, it would never have been the same. And they'll always remember that in, in their life and uh, their voice. And I think that's what I was seeing come through in the inauguration. I think we have a little Maya Angelou there uh, coming forth. So when, so you said you wrote your first, first poem when you were in first grade. Uh, I, I don't dare ask you about it. Um, I'm sure it was charming. <laughs> and engaging, <laughs> um, but I think I, I read something about you when you were sixteen. Something, someone challenged you, or am I correct in that? Well, so it's interesting because I want to. There's several things I want to address. Like, uh, I love the I love the research because you. Yes, in sixteen at sixteen, um, I was writing journalistically in high school, and I had a great journalism teacher, Mr. Connolly. And he just challenged me to revise. Uh, he challenged me to, to think about the world in, in, in some really interesting ways, really ways that contradicted what, the way I was being raised, in fact. Uh, um, thinking a little bit larger than I was being taught to think. Uh, and that was great. Uh, it, it's, it's something I go back to. Uh, all the time, I think about Mr. Con in fact, during the summers, it's when I think about Mr. Connolly actually, because I would send Why him the summer because I would always send him work in the summer. I, I would see. send him poems, I would send him things I were writing, and he was so encouraging. He would write back, um, and he would talk to me, and and that was a great sort of lesson too about poetry and about the communities that poetry and writing makes, because mm -hmm. I think one of the things is it's so extracurricular. Um, to be a writer, no one is like, no one's like, oh man, you want to be a writer? Awesome. Let's let's set you up. Right, you know, you tell people you want to be a lawyer, people are so behind that. You want to be an engineer? Behind that. You want to even play basketball or be a football? Behind that. You tell people you want to be a writer, people are like, so you want a star, right? Um, and so, uh, Mr. Connolly was one of those that. It's where writing really happens. Really, writing really happens in these like back doors and after school, uh, in the summer, when no one can see. You know, it's, in it's interesting because we know we can find research to support anything if we really look hard enough, but there is conclusive research that tells us, especially in the era of area of creative productive thinking, that generally, if we really think really hard, there's probably one person that has made a, distant, a, a difference in our lives. And that person is generally a teacher as you're giving your example, Mr. Conley, and setting our life on track and also developing a passion. And uh, one, of the, one of the dimensions that we talk about, we hope to talk about when, with each of our guests, Phyllis and, and myself, we hope that we're able to identify that we have someone that has developed such a passion for their art. And, and we really think that, that you have that passion. And as I was looking at your particular uh, poem, Philadelphia to Mount Vernon. I guess you can guess why I was looking at that one. Um, I had many things going through my mind. And one of them being that for me, I think the difference between the, the prose and the poetry, as I've said, would be the senses. But you did something for me in that poem as I was reading it that I wasn't expecting. And it's kind of humorous. Uh, coming from that area of Philadelphia and South Jersey, myself growing up, 
you mentioned the kiss on the Delaware and the smell of the chemicals. I thought of my kiss, which was not on the Delaware. I'm not sure I want to think about it. But I thought, thank goodness I was upwind because those chemicals smell so bad. And if your kiss reeked of that, of those chemicals, no wonder you can't forget it because of all the factories. So when folks now land in Philadelphia, that's not just the fuel from the plane you're smelling. It's some of those if you happen to be upwind or downwind, whatever happens. But the reason I mentioned that, not, not just for the humor, and I appreciate that you're smiling over that, um, but I think... When I read your poetry, I felt that I was watching a movie. And not only was I watching a movie, because, of course, the, the artistic part and the visuals were amazing for me. The kiss on the Delaware, so simple. Uh, you, you're inter- you, you talked about Mick Wittgenstein and Foucault and, and going from the crumb of the Delaware at that point to the, the analytic philosophers, their arguments. I, I find that amazing and refreshing, but the sensory experience was, was quite interesting and, and, and quite incredible. Um, I can, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to your, your book coming out, your next book. Wow. Thank you. It's so, it's, it's, it's so interesting. Like, I love that that was the way you connect. Like for me, I'm, I'm always interested in where people come into a poem because it's not always the first line, right? Like, but when you find your way in all of a sudden the poem sort of how it, it becomes sort of multitudinous, uh, becomes mansion-like in a lot of ways. Um, and well, so, since, I, we're, since yeah. we're talking about revolution, it, and also in that poem, you talked about the lawn jockey with the Blessed Virgin looking down mm-hmm. on, on the lawn jockey. Uh, was that a church setting or a yard setting? Because in my growing up, and no one complained about them, there was another reason. There were lawn jockeys all over the place. White families, black families, it didn't matter. And there was a, probably because we were in, we had the racetracks. We had the AC racetrack. Mm-hmm. We had Garden State racetrack. Mm-hmm. And horse horse racing was an interest. And jockeys were respected. Mm-hmm. Not to say that the statues were always treated with respect. They seemed to move around sometimes. Uh, my yeah. father wanted one and my mother wouldn't let him have one. Uh, but the happened. idea... The idea of how you messed, messed the Blessed Virgin looking down on the jockey, I found that rather interesting. Where did that come from? Chicago. Uh, that's from living in Chicago and walking my daughter to daycare every day down this one street. Uh, her daycare was at an in-home daycare that was like two blocks from our house. And I would walk by, you know, like you walk by and you walk by fences and, and mm-hmm. I'm walking by this this sort of eclectic gathering of lawn material. But what's interesting, I think, why I found it, why there was no grass. Right? There was, uh-huh. So there was the lawn jockey, and then there was the <laughs> marriage, right? And they were in the same space. And I, It's true. And I just thought, this is such an interesting juxtaposition. To me, that's how art happens, is mm-hmm. these interesting juxtapositions, right? These, lawn, the, these two symbols that carry so much weight so much American historical weight, world historical weight. And so for, yeah. for those who haven't read that, do you want to start to just share some of your poetry with us? That one or the, are slaves caring for masters and deforming mastery or um, the, you know, the, you really know from Philadelphia I, I, to yeah. poetry? I, I, I don't have, the, it's funny, the two that I've, I, I brought up that I was like, oh, maybe I'll t- read these two are actually not not those, but that's uh, okay. I think we need to hear it from the master himself, being Roger <laughs> and watching. And uh, I'd like you to share. And we have about five minutes left, and we do have a couple questions okay. from our audience. So I'd like to. Poem. They make a nice uh, closing. Uh, okay. I can read one. I can read one poem, and then please. Uh, uh, and this one sort of, again, is thinking about my upbringing slightly as it overlaps with James Baldwin's upbringing, actually. Mm. It was also raised in a storefront Pentecostal church. Grendel, all lions must lean into something other than a roar. James Baldwin, for instance, singing Precious Lord. 
his voice as weary as water broken over his scalp. In a storefront sanctified church's baptismal pool, all those years ago when he wanted to be somebody's child and on fire in that being, Lord, I want to be somebody's child and chosen water spilling over their scalp. Water taking the shape of their longing, a deer diving into evening traffic and the furrow drawn in the air over the hood of the car, power, and wanting to be something alive and open. Lord, I want to be alive and open. A glimpse of power, the shuffle of a mother's hand over a sleeping child's forehead, as if clearing the city's rust from its face which we mostly are, a halo of rust, a glimpse of power. James Baldwin leaning into the word light, his voice jostling that single grain in his throat as if he might drop it or already have. I am calling to that grain of light, to that gap between his teeth where the many of us fatherless sleep and bear and be whatever darkness or leaping thing we can be. In James Baldwin's mouth, my difficult beauty, my weak and worn, my future as any number of angels, which is not unlike the beast Grendel coming out of the wild heaven into the hills and halls of the meat house at the harpist call with absolute prophecy in his breast and desire for mercy, for a friend, an end to drifting in loneliness. And in that coming down out of the hills, out of the trees, for once, bringing humans the best vision of themselves, which of course, must be slaughtered. Mm. Roger, you're on your way to Radcliffe at Harvard. I want to make sure our, our viewers yeah. know that for a fellowship. So we wish you well and congratulations. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for the wonderful interview. Thank you all for the conversation. It went too fast. <laughs> it goes way too fast. <laughs> it, it does. Thank you, Roger. Um, and I think we'll have to leave it there. Uh, let our audience know you have been watching The Creative Life on Think Tech Hawaii. Today, Darlene Boyd and I have been discussing poetry and how it wakes us up to the meaning behind revolution itself. Thanks for participating. And thanks to our viewers to turn tuning in. I'm Phyllis Bleece. We'll be back in two weeks with another edition of The Creative Life. Aloha.